He was of humble origin and is practically self-educated. At 19, he came to London to do secretarial work and a few years later found him active in the socialist movement, serving his apprenticeship at Soapbox Oratory in Hyde Park and Trafalgar Square and becoming noted in labor circles as an organizer and writer. Little did the nation suspect in those Victorian days that the lean, long-haired Scotch scribbler would one day be a world figure, secretary of the Labour Party for 11 years, and then its leader, member of the London County Council for four years, and then elected as a member of Parliament. These were the steps by which he rose to high estate in the nation's affairs. The Labour Party's great success in 1923 resulted in his selection as Prime Minister. And as their majesties wrote to Parliament in the auspicious year of 1924, with all the famous trappings of age-old regal pomp and ceremony, the entire world marveled at the curious twist of British democracy that plucked from the masses, from the very bosom of anti-patriotic internationalism, a self-made battler against British conservatism, to be the king's man, the creator of a ministry, the maker of government. Premier Macdonald's Scotch sagacity soon became paramount in all international debt parlors. In Paris, he is welcomed by Premier Ario on the eve of the Lausanne Conference. His stand on settlements and cancellation at Lausanne ring on the world. And again in Paris, he and Premier Ario confer at the critical moment when the French leader is facing the wreck of his ministry over the December war debt payment. And then came the Prime Minister's epical trip to Rome. General Balbo, Italian air minister, himself pilots the huge tri-motored hydroplane with the McDonnell party aboard from Genoa to Ostia. And there, for the first time on record, Premier McDonald and Premier Mussolini meet on Italian soil. A meeting destined to result in the announcement of the famous Four Power Treaty, Europe's own peace pact, embracing Britain, France, Germany, and Italy. It is during this important conference in Il Duce's own office that the elements of Mussolini's recently adopted peace plan is drafted, a ten-year pact that now, months after its presentation, looms as one of the outstanding instruments of the era in world politics. As the originator of the Macdonald disarmament plan, the British Premier was the first European leader sought out by President Roosevelt after the great change in administration at Washington. Invited to confer with the American President prior to the Geneva and London parlors, the Premier and his gracious daughter journeyed to the United States, where they received with honor and acclaim by the city of New York in the fleeting minutes they have to spend in New York waters. The eyes of America and of the world are on McDonald today as he lands, boards a train for Washington. The peace and probable prosperity of all nations are in the balance. This visit means much to the summer's parlors. And on those parlors rests the structure of modern civilization itself. An agreeable, almost a startling surprise awaits Premier McDonald at the White House the American presidential residence. Instead of expected stiffness and formality, the president and his charming wife are out on the front steps to greet with warmth and true American hospitality their guests from overseas. The prime minister long has been close to the hearts of the American public. His tribute to the forever nameless American fighting man whose heroic dust lies under the slab at their unknown soldier's tomb won their high regard. The self-educated Scotsman of the 80s is made a doctor of laws by George Washington University and gets a real thrill out of the collegiate mortarboard. On his visit to the majestic capital, home of the American Congress and the seat of government, he is accorded the courtesy of the United States Senate and addresses the lawmakers of our sister nation, winning great applause and praise by his apt and enlightening remarks. One of the highlights of his stay in Washington is his appearance at the National Press Club the shrine of American newspaperdom. 
and hosts of the National Press Club. I am really delighted to be your guest once again. We want the machinery of production and of consumption to begin to go round again. And we can't do that by any system of pure nationalist economics. My American friend, if you want to come across a good nationalist, go to Scotland in order to find him. I'm proud of being a nationalist. I'm proud of my history. I'm proud of my culture. I'm proud of my kith and my kin. I'm proud of the part that we have played in the history of mankind. But if I translate that pride of mine, that nationality of mine, into nationalist economics, if I engage in the rather tragic delusion of imagining that a Scotland made economically self-contained is going to make its tribute to the world's wealth, then what I shall find is this, that I shall both impoverish myself and impoverish my neighbors outside my own boundaries. The United States, Great Britain, France, must protect themselves. We have been going through difficult times. What's the way to handle them? Agree how to get out of them. Happiness, contentment, enjoyed by large populations, living on high standards of life, can only be maintained by a freely flowing international exchange. And how we are going to devise that freely pro flowing exchange is to be the main purpose of the International Economic Conference. Other well-known diplomats arrive in Washington for preliminary talks with Roosevelt and with Cordell Hull, American Secretary of State, including Prime Minister Bennett of Canada and Edouard Ariel, former Premier of France. This mission ended. Premier MacDonald says goodbye to Washington, having laid the groundwork for Anglo-American cooperation in the momentous days to follow. Days that are to startle the world with Roosevelt's appeal to all nations for immediate action on the MacDonald disarmament plan and for real constructive results at the London Economic Conference. And so the Premier is welcomed back to number 10 Downing Street by a nation enthusiastically impressed with the greatness of his efforts for world betterment. What manner of man is Roosevelt, the sudden idol and magic leader of the American people, whose first bold strides into world politics seem to herald the dawn after dark years of post-war turmoil? What is his history? 